Thank you for joining. We will start in a few minutes. Hi, then is it okay if we start? Are you done? Yeah. Oh. Okay, just waiting because I see people are still joining. So let's wait like uh, two minutes. Yes, I agree. Okay. In the meantime, uh, everyone, um, so I see many people joined already. Who do you use Kubernetes? You can use the chat, you can raise your hand. Uh, if you so if you look on the bar downside downstairs in the pin, you can raise your hand to ask something, to say something. So please use it and we'll we'll see your hand raising. Um, and uh, we can uh, we can talk, we can uh, look on your message. So use it, yes. Good, good choice, Amit. So you can talk now, you can unmute yourself, uh, tell us about yourself, if you're familiar with Kubernetes. Uh -oh. So just send a message. Um, for new joiners, please, please make sure to mute yourself and um, Sorry, I'll start. I'm going to do it a bit again once uh, people are still joining. So today's session will be presented by Idan Shaha for the reactor community. Um, as you may know, the reactors are local hubs for technical learning, uh, where developers and startup professionals can connect and build new skills on Azure and open source technologies. So we offer a diverse mix of hands-on workshop, uh, panel discussion, community events in all of our reactors globally. Uh, but due to COVID, our space is currently closed, so we focus more on online events such as today's event. Before we start, I uh, just wanted to let you know the session is recorded. Uh, the recording will be available to you later um, at the Reactor YouTube channel, and I'm going to share the link with you uh, at the chat box soon. Um, as Idan mentioned before, uh, we're trying to make this a bit interactive, so please feel free to ask questions, raise your hands, uh, two features that you have uh, using Teams. Uh, and we will try to uh, answer your question during the session or at the end. I think I'll leave this to Idan to decide on how to manage the questions, but feel free to, to participate, uh, introduce yourself, um, and so on. Yeah. Um, I think lastly is just the survey link that I wanted to share with you, and I'm going to put that at the chat box as well. So we uh, we conduct surveys for our online event, and we would appreciate if you can take a minute or two to fill in the survey for this event. Let us know what you think. Uh, share your feedback. That will be uh, super helpful for us. Um, I think that's that's it from uh, from my end, Idan. So I'm going to pass it on to you now to kick off the session. Um, Yes, anything that you need, please feel free to uh, write on the chat box. Uh, once you don't speak, appreciate if you can just uh, stay on mute so it won't disturb the, um, the session. Um, I think that that's it. So, Idan, over to you. Thank you, Maria. And I'm really happy to be here um, to deliver a session in the Reactor community. That's really a pleasure for me. 
Um, and I see that more people are joining. So, so I've been uh, feeding them so far. So I'll do that. And so I know that we, we have already 80 people here. So that's going to be a little bit challenging to have a discussion, but let's try to use the chat. So um, if you can, uh, all of you participants, please um, in the chat, tell me uh, where are you based in? I'm interested to see how many people we have from different countries. That's going to be really interesting. because I know the, that uh, Moria kind of uh, advertised the session in different countries. So, oh, nice. We have Australia, we have uh, London, we have Israel, we have Paris, Tel Aviv. Wow, we have, wow, we have Norway. Wow, we have a lot of different areas. Um, good job, Moria. Wow, amazing. <laughs> and people are still joining. That's, wow, insane. Great, so um, I'm here today to talk with you about uh, Kubernetes buzzwords and basically everything you wanted to know but never dared to ask. Um, Dave, Dave if, I, if I may ask, uh, please, can you turn off the camera and as well as draw Cohen, please? Uh, because uh, we're recording the session and um, when we have the recording, it's going to be split in, into different uh, ties. So please turn off the camera. Um, so today I'll be talking, I'll, I will be talking about Kubernetes buzzwords. Uh, so as you know, um, there's so many Kubernetes initiatives and innovations and this thing never stops it's always being innovated always being developed and the community around kubernetes is huge and you know sometimes it's not so easy to follow every single new project so i chose uh, several projects that i think that are important to know um, some of them are already production ready and some of them are still in development but the, the, the important thing about them, that all of them are really useful, really important to know, and they can be really useful for your projects. So stay tuned, it's going to be really, really interesting and interactive. So, um, so my name is Dan Shahar, I'm a Cloud Solutions Architect in uh, Microsoft Middle East in Africa. Um, so a little bit about myself and about my vision. So I really like to cook meat and to eat meat. And that's one of my passions. And it comes really good together with my passion to technology. And I'll tell you why. So I have, uh, are you familiar with different cooking methods for, um, for meat? If, if you are, and do, draw a coin, please. Can you turn off the camera? Um, and if you are familiar, there are different methods. And you can write in the chat what kind of methods are you familiar with. So the, there's barbecue, right? Uh, there is smoker. There is um, um, you can age the meat. You can uh, have dry aged meat. Yeah, there is so many different kind of meat sous vide, right? That's amazing. I really like this method. Um, and I have I have a smoker and my smoker is connected to uh, my Wi-Fi. It's an electric smoker, so I can control it from my phone. And I have also um, a thermometer that I can measure the temperature of the meat. And that way I can know exactly uh, how if it's medium or medium rare or it's um, well done, so that's really nice. And everything comes together into my into my uh, phone or my laptop, so I can I can cook my meat during uh, work. So that's really nice, and that's uh, that's my passion because I believe that technology helps us in our day to day life. Uh, another thing that I mostly do when I'm presenting on stage, on a physical stage, not a virtual stage, is to show you my shoes because I, I'm kind of crazy with shoes. I have like more than 40 pairs and every single um, physical presentation uh, session I'm, I'm, I'm delivering, I'm trying to come with another one. So my audience can keep uh, be curious about my shoes. 
Um, so what I'm doing in Microsoft, so I, I'm part of um, a unit that work with partners, with different kind of partners, whether it's services partners, ISVs partners, um, but the main idea in my unit, in the unit that I'm part of, is that we look at partners, uh, not as customers. And that's an interesting change. That's the difference between uh, customers to partners. We believe in partnership and we do partnership with our partners. So let's talk about different partnership we have in, in, my, in my unit. So for instance, um, we have in Azure uh, um, a service that calls that called Azure Map, and Azure Map is basically um, a service that is delivered and maintained by uh, Moveit. So that's a third party um, service, but it, it's a first party service in Azure. It's a first class citizen in Azure. So in fact, if you go to the Azure portal and you look for Azure Maps, you don't, you don't even know that that's um, a third party service. This is one, si one single partnership we're doing, and we have a lot more partnership, um, and I can spend hours talking about them, but that's not the case here. So um, here's my details. Uh, if you like, if, you, if you're gonna like my presentation, my slides and my uh, session, um, Feel free to post me a line in LinkedIn or add me into the into your LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, or just send me an email if you have some questions later on. Or you know, I like to connect. I'm I'm available in every single medium. Now let's talk about Kubernetes buzzwords. So are you ready to hear some Kubernetes buzzwords? Because that's why we're here. So you know. There's so many Kubernetes buzzwords, and let me know if you're familiar with some of them. Just post in the chat um, if you're familiar with Helm. Of course, you're familiar with Helm. Who doesn't know Helm? Kira, Gluster, uh, Porter, Duffel. Are you familiar with each one of these these uh, innovations? Please post in the chat. It's going to be really fun if we're going to have it interactive. No, you're not familiar. More, thank you. Thank you for participating. Yeah, cool. Safi is for storage, you're right. Uh, Victor, you're not familiar. OK, great. So for those of you who are not familiar with this kind of service technology, um, I chose some of them to, uh, for today. So it's going to be really interesting to you. Kira is really cool. Jay, thank you. Um, so you know, sometimes it's really tough to follow. And I know, I know I'm know, i doing a lot of, a lot of sessions and a lot of people come to me saying, you know, how do you keep track of everything? How do you, how do you know like every single project, and how do you able to to keep up on everything? And you know, that's really tough. I know. Well, that's kind of my job, so I I'm, I live in that. But for you, you're not alone. I mean, a lot of people. Uh, security best practices. That's not for today. I'm sorry, Mikael, uh, but you can you can um, talk to me later on, and I'll, I'll be help, happy to help you. So you're not alone, and you know that's not really easy. And so let's get started. So I chose uh, some of the services, some of them from the last from the past six months. Some of them are a little bit more mature. Some of them already production ready, and some of them are not. But all of them are really interesting. So I'm going to be talking about Cloud Native Application Bundle. That's, a, that's a three different uh, projects that comes together to uh, give you the ability to build uh, Cloud Native Application Bundles. We'll talk about it deeply later. I'll be talking about Kira, and I'll also be de demonstrating Kira. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Synab. Um, SMI, sorry, Service Mesh Interface. I'll be talking about Azure Arc. I'll be talking about Dapper. So I think that's a good timing to start. Let's talk about Azure Arc. Who is familiar with Azure Arc here? Please, chat. Come on, guys. Let's make it interactive. Are you familiar with Azure Arc? No. Um, so, Tell me, 
how many Kubernetes cluster do you have? If you have, um, if you don't have, just uh, say that you don't have a Kubernetes cluster at all. Um, who here uses Kubernetes in production? Oh, you have four Kubernetes clusters. That's interesting. Um, Oliver, uh, does uh, do all of your clusters are in the same um, in the same platform? That's that's an interesting one. Because if it if you're doing the same platform, uh, it's a little bit different than okay, all of them in Azure. So that's interesting. Uh, do we have someone here that does um, multi-cloud Kubernetes cluster? Um, okay. So for those of you who has uh, who have Kubernetes cluster clusters in different cloud providers on on premises or on devices, that that can be really useful for you. One of the biggest challenges about having multiple Kubernetes clusters is how to manage them, right? Uh, we have to manage four, five, six different clusters, and each one of them is in um, a different cloud provider. And how that's a really big challenge for us. And that's where Azure Arc comes to the picture. Azure Arc uh, gives you the ability to manage every single cluster on the edge, on public cloud, wherever it is, on the same platform in Azure. And by Using Azure Arc, you're going to be able not just to manage it, but also to control it, and also to use all of the Azure um, AKS uh, features, not, not all of them, but um, the ecosystem for AKS inside Azure, you're going to be able to use it for your own Kubernetes cluster, no matter, no, no matter where it is. And that's one of the interesting stuff. Um, so basically, once you connect your Kubernetes cluster to Azure Arc, it becomes a first-class citizen in Azure. And it means it's going to be have uh, a resource ID in Azure. Once it has a resource ID in Azure, Azure thinks it's an Azure resource. And because it thinks it's an Azure resource, you can use our billing uh, features. You can uh, apply our security ecosystem to your Kubernetes cluster. You can manage your cluster. You can look on the logs. You can connect it to log analytics, for instance. Um, and then you can define alerts on your uh, Kubernetes logs. You can um, use uh, ACIs, ACI to scale your cluster. Um, and you can have all of the states and all of your clusters managed by Azure on the same platform and the same familiar platform, no matter where your cluster is. And you know, today you have clusters every single, everywhere. Like you have clusters on, on cars, you have clusters on IoT devices, you have clusters on on premises, on even in in your in your home. I know someone that installed you uh, Kubernetes cluster on us on a really small uh, uh, PC, and he uses it for his smart home. So that's really fun, but it becomes a lot more complicated when you want to manage a lot of clusters. And if it's um, like a real business company, it becomes harder. So that's where Azure Arc can be very, very useful for you. Any questions so far? Let's see. OK, let's move on. So now I want to talk about Cloud Native Application Bundle. Cloud Native Application Bundle is a standard format uh, for packaging Cloud Native Application, but not just for Cloud Native, native Applications. It is cloud agnostic. It helps you to deliver applications across teams, organizations, marketplaces, and even offline. And it's signed and secure. So what Synap solves actually? Because you know, I try to explain what Synap is, but that's not really explaining what Synap is. Um, so let's talk about some challenges we have as developers, as DevOps engineers. So before we dive into Synap, I want you to post your current role, whether it's a um, DevOps engineer or a developer or a cloud architect. Um, that can be helpful. 
that can be helpful for, for, for me to understand um, what's the real challenge for you. So Alex is a DevOps. We have uh, machine learning engineers and integration engineers, great, and project and delivery managers, great. So we have like um, um, really diverse roles here, that's great. So let's talk about um, the, the, the challenges we have in the development world. So every single one that developed, developed an application in the past or in the future um, knows that uh, once you finish the development and you want to give it to someone else or you want to install it in someone else's machine or in the cloud or whatever, that's where the challenges starts. So basically, um, I, I finished developing my service and now my friend in, in, the, in, in my team wants to use my service and then he says, oh, how do I install it? Oh, now I need to configure it. What, it doesn't work for me. Um, what did you do? How do you make it work? You know, it's a ping pong and we, we're going to move back and forth, back and forth until the service finally got installed. Right? That happens to everyone. And that, that one thing, Synap can solve it. Another one, so look at it as, a, as a, an MSI for the cloud, for uh, distributed applications in the cloud. So instead of, you know, going over endless readmes, reading the instructions, uh, trying to, uh, to run the instructions, and you know, once um, something doesn't work for us in the instructions and we finally got into some errors or issues, we basically need to destroy the whole environment, go back to the start and start all over. And it's really, it's really painful, right? So that's where Synap really can solve a lot of, a lot of things and similar um, challenges. So basically it wires the whole solution as a bundle, no matter if it's installation, configuration, deployment, whatever. That's, that makes your application as a package uh, from the infrastructure side to the application side. And even more, you can use Synap to wrap up um, 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 Terraform, whatever technology you use to build your application, okay? So let's let's understand. Let's better understand. So, for developer standpoint, it allows people to install your code easily, without having any challenges. Just install your code, your your service easily. For, from from uh, the DevOps standpoint, it makes uh, it's an immutable entity for your distributed application. And for everyone's standpoint, if you want to use something, just use it. You don't have to learn how to install it. That's not really matter. Okay, so let's understand how Synab built is built. So Synab is built from uh, Synab bundle is basically a format, a standard. It has the name of the bundle, the bundle version, the description, some keywords. It also has some credentials and path. Uh, in environment variables, it has the executable image, it has the installer program, and it has some parameters because we want to have a bundle that is parameterized and it can be controlled from uh, external parameters. Now, we have two more um, uh, tools here. We have Duffel and we have Porter. Porter is used to be, uh, let's start with Duffel, sorry. Duffel is built for, um, it's a command line tool. It's built for um, installing and managing uh, Cina bundles. So if you want to build your own Cina bundle, you're going to use Duffel and you're going to build it and then you can install, pack it or unpack it with Duffel. Now, um, that's nice, but with Duffel you have to understand how Cina works. And Cina, trust me, it's a little bit complicated. Now you can you can get you can dive into it. You can understand it. That's not um, something that, that's feasible. Okay, you can you can do it. I trust you that you can do it. And yes, the recording is it, there is a recording. 
So um, you can use DAFL, but then you're going to need to learn house in a box. If you don't want to learn how to a box and you still want to use the Synab abilities and, you know, uh, uh, take advantage of, of the cloud native application bundle, Porter can be really useful for you. Because with Porter, you basically don't need any bash scripts, any Docker files. You don't have to understand the Synab bundle. It's just a YAML file. It's uh, connects all of your different tools that you already use, the existing tools that you use to, to deploy your application, to install your infrastructure, to configure your application, you can use it. So for instance, let's, uh, let's think about a typical application uh, delivery. So we have our application. Now we need to set up our infrastructure. So there's different kind of uh, infrastructures as, as code, uh, tools. So in my case, I, I like to use that Terraform. So I, I'll use, I'm going to use Terraform. And then after setting up the infrastructure, I want to install. So I, for instance, I, I use my infrastructure as code to install my Kubernetes cluster. And I want to deploy my application into my Kubernetes cluster. So in order to deploy my application, I need to use Helmchart. So I, I'm going to use my Helmchart to install my application. But before that, I need to set up my database and I need to run my migration into my database because I need to have my data in the database, right? So that's a lot of manual um, processes that we're doing that can be uh, tied together using Porter eventually. So let's have an, a look on how does a Porter YAML file looks like. So we have here the name of the Porter YAML file. We have different mixings. Mixing us are kind of plugins. It tells Porter what kind of cloud providers or cloud technologies you're going to use. So in this case, I'm going to use the Azure API and the Helm chart. Then I have some credentials. The credentials are stored in my laptop, but then Porter uses it. We have parameters because we want to make sure our template is parameterized because we want to make, we want to be able to to deploy it to different kind of, of uh, services, whether it's uh, Kubernetes or uh, virtual machines or just web app applications or you know whatever you want. So um, we want to make sure it's parameterized. Now um, that's uh, that's our parameters, and then we have the installation part. So we're gonna create uh, an Azure MySQL machine inside Azure. Um, so this is the username. I use the parameter to configure the username, and th this is the location. I also can use the parameter to define the location. Um, then I use the service a uh, server name. Uh, I decided to uh, disable the SSL enforcement. I uh, have a name for the database, and then that's really important. Um, look on the output side. Once. Um, my my SQL machine is finished, uh, is deployed uh, properly. We need to configure my Helm application, my my Kubernetes application, to talk to the uh, my SQL machine, right? To communicate with, and that's really interesting because the Helm chart won't be deployed until the output is uh, is there, and the output in my case is the MySQL host machine. So let's look on the Helm side. So here I'm going to install a WordPress application, a really simple one. And look here, you can see that I'm waiting for the output. Once the MySQL machine finished deployed, um, I finished the deployment, sorry, um, you, I, I, I'm going to use the MySQL host to configure my uh, my um, WordPress application to communicate with the MySQL machine. So nothing was done here manually. Everything is connected through this template, and that's really uh, the real thing. You can use bad scripts inside it. You can use uh, infrastructure as code. You can use your whole existing set uh, tool set to deploy your application, and that's is a bundle that 
this is the cloud native application bundle. Do yeah. you have questions so far? Okay, if you don't have a question, we can keep going. So, let's talk about scale. So, um, so for those of you who use Kubernetes cluster, I mean, you probably scale your application down and up um, every single day, right? Um, and there are different ways to um, to scale your application, right? Um, and that's where I want you to be uh, contributing. So, what are the different ways you can use for uh, scaling your pods? Go on, guys. You can speak up. You can unmute yourself and speak. Okay, come on. Never mind. Okay, so there are different ways. Oh, someone just uh, posted a message. Let's see. To scale up. I want to scale up now. What? Let me scale up. One part. Okay, so there are different ways to scale up your, your, your pods. Okay, um, and one of the most popular ways is using resources, right? Once we have um, um, CPU, memory, and so on. And once our container um, reach the limit of the, of the CPU or the memory, we're gonna scale it up, right? And we're gonna add more pods, more containers. That's nice, okay? That's um, like almost every, every company does that. Um, but maybe there's another way. Maybe there is more efficient way, more smart way, a smarter way, more efficient to scale up applications in Kubernetes. So let me think about a typical architecture, uh, an event-driven applica application that communicates between, the, that the different services communicate with each other through a message bus, right? Um, so the message bus has different messages inside it, correct? And then we have consumers. The consumers wants to uh, want to read the um, the messages and to do something with them. Now, what if we could um, scale up and down our application based upon amount of messages in that queue, right? That sounds uh, interesting, right? So when we don't have messages at all, do we need to have a container running? And the answer is no. That's where we can scale to zero our application. And when we have messages in the queue, we're gonna scale up our application. That's the, that's why our um, that way is a little is a lot more efficient than scaling up and down our application based upon amount of, uh, based upon um, resources in the cloud, in the cluster, in the, in the application. And we scale to when we don't have any resources, we won't pay anything. So this is where KIDA comes to the picture. KIDA is a Kubernetes-based event-driven autoscaler. It has a lot of different sources, um, and there are a lot more in the website. So basically, you can, you can connect KIDA to your Kubernetes cluster, and that allows your Kubernetes, your Kubernetes applications to scale to first um, scale based upon the amount of messages in a queue, based upon uh, different metrics in uh, in your uh, logs or in uh, in the metrics you have. Okay, and then what KIDA does, it disables your your uh, deployment in Kubernetes. So you won't have any containers running if it's not needed. And if it's needed, fine. Kubernetes talks to the uh, Kira talks to your uh, HPA, the horizontal pod autoscaler inside of Kubernetes, and it tells it, "Oh, listen, I need five more pods. 
and then the HPA will give you five more pods. So what? How Kira works actually? So it adds a new CRD, okay? Um, so it it adds a scaled object, and the scaled object tells you tells you uh, Kubernetes, look, this is my deployment. And this is my queue. Now, check in with the queue, see how many messages it has. And when it doesn't have messages, tell that deployment to be scaled to zero. And when it has messages, scale, up, scale it up based upon how many messages. Now, how, it, how, how does Kida know how many messages and what is the threshold for um, the scaling? So this is an example of um of a con of um, a queue and it tells uh, kida that one pod can consume five messages yes you can set also a minimum um value for for um for a pod so someone asked here a question can you set a minimum number of pods for uh, example one so you can uh, lag when a message arrives yes you can you can do it you can decide that you have a, you have at least one one um, one pod, but that's not the, the case. That's not the idea. And you know because it containers containers can spin up really fast, so you don't have to worry about uh, about um, warm up time, for instance, because it can be scaled up really fast. And I'm gonna show it to you. So I want to talk a little bit about. A really interesting combination. KIDA, we just talked about it. ACI, ACI is Azure Container Instances. ACI lets you drop a, a single container into the cloud and just don't worry about it. It's going to be running in the cloud easily. Plus, Virtual Kublet. Virtual Kublet, it's an open source project that connects ACI to Kubernetes cluster. And then you can be, you can have Cluster without no, so every single container running in your cluster can be an ACI by itself, and it gives you a lot of abilities. One of the greatest thing about it is that it's a micro billing, and you don't have to pay um, when you don't run. Okay, with ACI you pay just for the single container, not for the whole machine. And if you use just one, if you have just one single container. Um, in your cluster, I don't think you need to pay for a whole machine, a whole virtual machine, right? That's, that doesn't make any sense. So with ACI, you can pay only for one container. Now, Azure Functions is our serverless um, framework. Okay, it's a serverless uh, framework for uh, in the cloud in Azure. Now, the combination of KIDA plus ACI plus virtual kubelet plus Azure Functions gives you the ability to run serverless applications with Azure Functions because with KIDA, Azure Functions can be can run on Kubernetes cluster. So you have serverless applications from the application side. So the design is serverless from the application side, but it also serverless from the infrastructure side because it's a serverless Kubernetes cluster. So you build serverless applications all the way from the infrastructure side to the application side. And that's really exciting. Because then you can have a lot of abilities of the serverless applications. For instance, uh, infinite scale. This is something that reached um, that can reach about with serverless application. But when you have a limit of the infrastructure, it cannot infinite scale. But with serverless Kubernetes cluster, you can have an, an infinite scale. And when it, when it comes together, it's a lot more powerful. So let's have a quick demo. So I have uh, my terminal. Can you see my laptop? Can you see my terminal? Yes, great. Cool. So what I'm going to do, I have my Kubernetes cluster. And I have two nodes in my cluster. 
I have the AKS agent pool, and I have the, the virtual node ACI Linux. Now, if you, if you remember, I talked about ACI, and this is not a physical node, that's not an, a real node, just a connection to ACI. So here, there is no resources binded. I don't know how many um, CPU it has, I don't know how many um, cores it has, how many memory, if it has a GPU, if it doesn't. Okay, and this is a regular AKS node that uh, I know how many resources it has. I know if it's a CP, if it's a GPU intensive or a CPU intensive. It's a regular node. Okay. Now I want to show you what I'm gonna do. So let's um, let's look on on that. So I have let's have let's have a look on my on my pod. Get pods. Sorry. And what you can see that I have just ignore the Azure Vault one. I have a RabbitMQ running. If I'm going to have a look on my deployment, so we can see that I have um, RabbitMQ consumer. We have the Azure Vault, but we don't see any consumer here. We just see the RabbitMQ itself. Why we see the rabbit in queue? Because it's a daemon set. Okay? It's not a deployment. But why can't we see the rabbit in queue consumers? That's an interesting question. Does anyone know? Um, yes, Ben, I can repeat the uh, ACI capabilities. So the ACI gives you the ability to drop a single container to the cloud. Take it, put it in the cloud, and that's it. ACI take care of scaling. ACI make sure that your container is healthy. If it doesn't, it restarts the container. Okay. This is ACI. It's a. Uh, it's like running a, a single Docker image in the cloud without installing Docker on a VM and so on. So it's a pass service for single container. Now when you connect. ACI Kubernetes cluster, it lets you the, to have a Kubernetes cluster without any nodes. Um, so you don't, so you won't be binded to a, spe to a specific amount of resources. So you can answer my question. I have a RabbitMQ consumer deployment, but I don't see any ready pods. Zero from zero. What does it mean? Why? Is it there? So the answer is I'm using Kida. And I don't have any consumers right now because I don't have any messages in that rabbit in queue. And to prove it, I'm going to show you how I'm pushing messages into the rabbit in queue. And then a lot of containers started to spin up. So with that, let's have a look on. On a single file, it's called the deploy publisher job. That's a job that puts 1,000 messages inside RabbitMQ. Uh, deploy publisher job. And as you can see, I'm going to put um, 1,000 uh, messages inside my queue. And um, so we, we will do that. Let's have a look on the deploy consumer. So uh, deploy consumer, consumer YAML file. As you can see, we have a consumer. Um, it's an image that reads messages from RabbitMQ. That's regular. But the difference is the scaled object. As you can see here, and I told you that before, um, we, could, we use the scaled object, that's a CRD that Kida config, uh, configure created. Um, and that CRD is going to be um, 
relevant to the rabbit MQ consumer deployment. And it's going to be calling the, um, the queue every five seconds. It's going to be the cooldown period is 30, sec is 30 uh, seconds. And the max replica count and the max containers is 30 containers. Um, so I can I can avoid survey, um, I can avoid um, many too many containers uh, running. Um, now it's gonna be uh, talking to my class to my uh, rabbit MQ, and um, every single container reads five messages. Now let's deploy the job. So what now we, we will see that um, we're going to have uh, 1,000 messages in the queue. And let's have a look on my containers, my current pod, get pod. So we can see that, uh, that uh, containers already started to spin up. Let's watch them, dash O, Y. And then we can see where that container is running. And we can see that these containers run inside the virtual node ACI. So it's not running inside the AKS agent pool, it's running inside the uh, virtual node. And that means that I'm paying only when it's running. Because as you see, I have this cluster for months and I don't have to pay for a lot of resources if I if I'm not really using it, right? If I don't really use it, why should I pay? And that that way I can avoid uh, extra payment and I can be really tight. And I can be really efficient with payment, with scaling. Okay. So right now we see that we have that that our pods handles 1,000 messages and it happened incredibly. It happened really fast. And you can see that containers already started starting to terminate. It means they finished their job. Uh, do we have any questions so far? Okay, if we don't have any questions, we'll continue. Let's move back to the presentation. So now I want to talk with you about service mesh. Now, you know, there are so many different service mesh implementations. We have Istio, we have Solio, we have Linkerd, we have Console, we have Console on Azure Managed. We have really a lot of service mesh implementations. But before um, we understand, before we talk about the, the, the implementation itself, we need to understand what service mesh is. Um, so service mesh is a reverse proxy. Um, what is a reverse proxy? A reverse proxy is a service that sits somewhere in, in my cluster in this case. And if I want to, to communicate with another service, I go through this reverse proxy. He knows all of the different services that I have and you know how to direct me to the service that I wanted to communicate with. Okay. And by having one single reverse proxy central in my cluster that every single um, request goes through this reverse proxy, we can have a lot of capabilities. And that's a service mesh. So a service mesh is basically a central re reverse proxy for the whole cluster. And with that, we can have load balancing. We can do service discovery. We can do service monitoring. We can do tracing because we know we have one service that knows every single communication we have in the cluster. We can do routing. We can, we can secure service to service communication because we can apply TLS between different services because we have just one service that knows who speak to each other. We can do fine-grained uh, traffic policies. We can decide which service can 
can talk to each service. And all of this by having one central reverse proxy. And let's name it service mesh. Now service mesh, we talked about it. We have too many implementations. And that's where it becomes a little bit complicated. How do we know which kind of implementation to choose? How do we know which service to choose? Should we choose service? So we should, should we choose the solo I.O.? Should we choose uh, Linkerd? Should we choose uh, console? You know, that, that's a good question. How we choose the right service mesh? And it, it becomes even harder because one, once we chose it, we need to start, there's a, a learning curve. There's a ramp up we need to do in a specific one. And if it doesn't work for us, and if it, this specific implementation is not good enough for our needs, then we need to learn another implementation, ramp up in another one, and to spend another two months um, and waste two months before? No. So that's where, where the service mesh interface comes to the picture. It's one single interface, a standard interface that Microsoft built in collaboration with so many different companies. And you can see here just a little bit of them. And with that, you can control every single service mesh implementation using one single interface. That's really similar to what we have in, already in Kubernetes, the Nginx, the Ingress, right? Because with Ingress, we can choose um, which uh, reverse proxy we want to use. If we want to use uh, H5 or um, in, uh, Nginx or the cloud providers one, correct? Um, so that's the same concept, but the service mesh interface is made for service meshes. So how it works? We have a service mesh interface. It has an in interface for routing, for telemetry, for policies, and so on. Then we use the service, center, uh, service mesh interface we learn the service mesh interface, and then we choose the specific implementation, Istio, Console, Linkerd, or whatever you want to use. Service mesh interface, make sure to integrate the interface with each one of these uh, different implementations. Let's see if we have questions so far. Um, I do. I think I I talked about Istio. Um, let's see what else we have here. Oh, someone asked here what's the difference between reverse proxy and and service registry. Do you mean for container registry? Um, so yes. Uh, so uh, Richard, please. Uh, Clarify the question if you mean for container registry. Uh, Rit, yes, Richard? Uh, Eric, sir, here. So uh, I would like to know how we uh, decide the, which service maps we are supposed to be choose actually. Because we have a lot of option here, right? So, but which one we need to be select? How can we, what are the different parameter to select the service maps? Okay, that's a good one. Um, so, First of all, there, there are different service meshes that that uh, support better different kind of features. So if you want to do TLS in, uh, encryption between different services, you should choose one service mesh. If you want to do um, um, uh, canary deployment, you should choose another service mesh. Um, it's not it's not just it's not as simple, but the direction is to understand which what are the features that you need, and then look for the service that better support that these uh, features. Um, also, another thing you need to consider is the complexity. Some service meshes are a lot more complex than others. For instance, Istio, which is a great service mesh, is really complex. But uh, in, in difference, uh, Linkerd is a really good service mesh. It has less features, I think, from uh, of uh, what uh, Istio has, but it's easier to use. So that's another thing you need to consider when you think about service mesh. 
or when you think to use service mesh. And by the way, service mesh is not the answer for everything. There's so many things you can achieve without service mesh and without the complexity that service mesh adds. So think about it. When you choose to use service mesh, think carefully if you really need it. Because for instance, if you want to have an advanced security in your cluster and you want to decide what are the, uh, we want to decide um, about which pods can communicate with which services, service mesh is not the only way to achieve it. You can also achieve it with the pod policies. Uh, so think about it when you choose, uh, when you think about uh, choosing service mesh. Um, so, uh, Valer, um, Oh, it doesn't have Istio. Um, no, I think Istio is also supported. Um, does AWS support SMI? So SMI supports every single Kubernetes cluster, no matter where your Kubernetes cluster is, because Kubernetes is a platform. It doesn't matter if your Kubernetes cluster is inside AWS or Azure or GCP or your on-premises or on the edge devices, eventually Kubernetes is Kubernetes. And the, the modifications that the cloud provider do is basically to integrate the Kubernetes cluster better with the cloud, with their cloud, but with the same Kubernetes in the place. So the answer is yes, Kubernetes uh, SMI supports also AWS. Okay, if we we finish with uh, the questions about SMI and service mesh, let's talk about Dapper, and that's our last um, uh, buzzword for today. So Dapper is an event-driven portable runtime for building microservices on the cloud and on the edge. Wow. Complex. Let's try to split it to different to, to smaller pieces. So we are building distributed application. And sometimes we spend a lot of time on building things that are not specifically related to our business. Correct? We have to um, we have to uh, build the uh, integration with the cloud, we have to, for instance, if we want to drop a specific file into a storage object file, okay, into a storage object. And so then we need to implement the, the integration with that object storage, whether it's a uh, blob storage or S3, it doesn't matter, but we need to implement it. We need to use the cloud provider API or the cloud provider um, um, uh, libraries and then wrap it and build and integrate it with our platform. And for some cases, we are going to build a, a library out of it because other developers are going to use it as well. So that's become a lot more complex. And basically, we, we spend our time in building something that's not related to our business. This is not our business. Our business is not to implement integration with different kind of services. Our business is to build our own software. And implementations and all of these kind of things, logging, uh, metrics, monitoring, all of these are side work that we're doing, but we have to do it because that's important. And we cannot have a, a service without integration with a cloud provider, without integration with, with the storage, with databases, with every single thing. And this is where Dapper comes to the picture because with Dapper, you don't have to write these implementations. Let me tell you a secret. Dapper does it for you. Dapper integrate with the cloud providers, with, every, with the, the different resources in the cloud providers. It works with every single application because it talks uh, JRPC. And with Dapper, you can get rid of all of the extra work you're doing for things that are not related to your business. It's a runtime. It can run in your application or alongside your application. It has no limits. 
can use it with every single programming language, any cloud, any edge. It's open source. There's an open API. So it has standard open APIs. And it's easily enabled uh, you to build microservices without think, doing every single thing that's not related to your business. So go ahead and look for Dapper. And with that, I finished. So if you have any questions, that's a good timing to speak up. I'm here to take some questions. Um, so feel free to ask me questions. Um, I move to this slide because I want you to uh, drop me a line if you have any questions uh, in the future. If you're gonna have something that you wanna ask me, go ahead and drop me a line. Uh, if you enjoyed my presentation, go ahead, scan the uh, QR code and it's going to be leading you to into my LinkedIn profile and I'd be happy to be connected with you. Um, if you don't want to use LinkedIn, just before I'm moving to the next one, if you don't want to use LinkedIn, that this, 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 these are my uh, information. You can, uh, you can uh, reach out to me in every single media, um, aka.ms slash idan. This is my LinkedIn profile. This is my email. This is my GitHub. This is my Twitter. Feel free to reach out to me whenever you want. Um, okay, that, um, I think that was pretty much on time. Uh, Ida, you yeah. are straight at 1 p.m. Israel time. Um, and as we said, like I don't see that we have any further questions, but thanks for sharing all your details so everyone can, whoever is interested, please contact um, Idan, um, for any questions about this session or um, other sessions that we have, you can also contact us at the reactor. So as Idan is presenting now the survey link, appreciate if you can take a minute or two to fill in the, the survey link. So I also shared it in the chat um, of the meeting and also the YouTube link where you will be able to see uh, the recording of today's session. Uh, within probably a few days, it should be available um, there. I think if there is nothing else from uh, your side, Idan, then we can uh, we can probably end today's session. So thank you, Idan, for this great presentation, and thank you everyone for joining us from so many different places in the world. That was really great to see. Um, yes, and if you have any any further questions, please feel free to to connect. Thank you, Maria, and I'll just add uh, that there, there are upcoming events of the reactors so stay tuned and look for the upcoming event and also uh, you can visit the meetup group for uh, the reactor tel aviv and um do you want and that's it basically yeah that's it also for my end so thank you and goodbye everyone bye bye thank you